This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with entrepreneur, business consultant, and academic Mike Glauser, and he talks to me about his new book, Main Street Entrepreneur, and how anyone can develop their own business ideas and launch their own company. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor here, and I'm delighted today to have Mike Glauser. Mike is an entrepreneur, business consultant, and executive director of the Clark Center for Entrepreneurship in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. Over the past 20 years, he has helped hundreds of students and entrepreneurs develop their business ideas and launch companies. His latest book, Main Street Entrepreneur, introduces a proven roadmap for starting and building a successful company. Michael got creative when researching for this new book. He interviewed 100 entrepreneurs during a 4,000-mile cross-country bicycle ride, which took in more than 100 cities. He is also the co-founder of My New Enterprise, which provides online training and development for universities, colleges, and government agencies. It's my great pleasure to have Mike on the show today. Welcome, Mike. Thank you very much, James. It's great to be with you. So share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. Well, I'm actually tra- traveling across America right now with a film crew, and we're doing a documentary film that's a follow-up to my book, Main Street Entrepreneur. We're filming experts at universities like Harvard and MIT and Stanford and entrepreneurs all across the country, and we're getting data for a project about the future of work in the world. And so we believe uh, due to the acceleration of technology, uh, many jobs will be eliminated. There's quite a few studies that show that that's the case. And we know we will create new industries and new jobs eventually, but there's kind of kind of going to be a gap here where there may be limited jobs as we know them. And so we believe more and more people are going to have to create their own jobs and their own companies. And so the film, uh, the documentary, is uh, basically explaining the future of work and how we can best adjust to those changes. So over the over the years, I mean, I think back in eighteen hundreds, I think it was only about one percent of people actually worked for someone. Everyone was, was essentially entrepreneurs, or they, they they ran their own businesses or farms or, or something. When did things really change? When did they really move into uh, people becoming employee more employees and moving away from an entre- more of an entrepreneurial mindset? Yeah, that's very interesting and important concept. That this idea of going out and finding a job is a relatively new. Uh, concept of the last century, if you go back just over 100 years ago, before the advent of mechanization and assembly lines, we, we all were entrepreneurs. Uh, no one grew up saying, i got to go find someone to hire me and give me money. But we grew up in communities and we said, okay, I've got to contribute value. I've got to find something this community needs and I've got to find a livelihood. And that was what we did for hundreds of years. And so we kind of feel like there's a throwback to that period of time where more, more of us are going to have to be in communities and find needs and meet those needs and build communities of customers that love us and make our living that way. And, and we really believe it's, it's possible. It's actually easier than it's ever been to do that. And when did you first get that entrepreneurial bug? When did the entrepreneurial bug first bite you? Well, I was uh, in college and I just kind of uh, fell in love with the concept of creating human organizations of bringing people together to set goals and create a great company where people wanted to work and they enjoyed being together and they were creating value. And so I went straight through school and studied uh, organizational studies and did a PhD in the field. And I started teaching and uh, I went to my first class. I turned around, I wrote my name on the board, Dr. Glauser, and turned around and it was an executive MBA program. And I was the youngest guy in the class by probably 10 or 15 years. And uh I thought, you know what, I'm going to go out in the world. I love this field, so I'm going to go out and be an entrepreneur and and practice what I've been preaching and see if I can do it. So I only stayed at the university for a few years and then left and uh, then ended up creating a number of companies and uh, selling some of those and later going back to the university. So I've, I've loved entrepreneurship, business building, leadership, team building, uh, pretty much my whole career. And obviously, at university, when you're you're lecturing and, and you're traveling all over the all over the place to to meet uh, meet entrepreneurs and and other professors at other universities, 
what's the, what's the kind of feeling that's kind of coming back from you from the the two ends of the generational gap, you know, the, from the millennials, what's their approach to thinking about entrepreneurship, but also the, the, a lot of the folks that maybe kind of built, they've been entrepreneurs and they've um, maybe uh, been employees for other companies and they get to the age of, you know, 50 or 55 or 60 and they're not really ready to retire and they want to go and start that business for the first time. Is there a difference in mindset between those two age groups? Yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, the uh, number of businesses started uh, around the world uh, by 50 plus year olds is growing significantly. And about half the businesses in America, I'm not sure about the UK, but in America last year, half of them were started by people that were 50 years old or older. Yeah. And the advantage is they've worked in corporations, uh, they haven't always loved their jobs, and now they want to do, you know, mid career towards the end of their career, they want to do something fun, something meaningful, and maybe they've even been laid off from a few jobs. So they have contacts, they, they know customers, they have a network, they see the problems firsthand, and they're very successful. Um, on the other hand, the millennial group, they uh, have these strong values, they want to work for companies that make a difference in the world, the idea of just working to make money is kind of appalling to them, and they all say they want to be entrepreneurs, but they're actually they're not doing it. Uh, startups at that age group, at least in America, is going down, and so they talk a big story, and some of them do start companies, but they're not, they're not actually launching ventures uh, as much as the older age groups. And, um, you know, I think a lot, a lot of it has just to do with that work ethic. ethic. It's very, very difficult, and they're kind of out still searching for who they are and what they want to be. And so we're not seeing as many startups in that younger age group right now. And in, you know, for both of those age groups, I mean, when you see on on the media, whether it's um, in the UK, we have Dragons Den, and in the U US, you have you know The Apprentice and Shark Tank and all all those shows, and it's the 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 the, the view that often comes across is is very much a that entrepreneurs are a certain type of person, very A type. Uh, Say it very sales focused. Um, it's all about venture capital, building something up very very quickly and, and selling it. Um, when you've kind of gone and, and done that your research with all these different groups, what's been their feedback or, in terms of what they perceive an entrepreneur to be? Yeah, I think that's that's kind of interesting. The bias at universities and government uh, incubators and so on has been towards this rapidly growing, highly scalable venture company. And maybe this is one of the reasons they're not as successful is they they believe you find some technology, you prove it with a small group, you go out and get some venture money, you scale it up rapidly, you have an exit strategy from day one, and you make a lot of money, and you make a lot of money for your people. And the reality is, is that is so hard to do that it's just only it's only done by less than 1% of the entrepreneurs around the world. And so they're taught that's what you're supposed to do, and they try to do it, and they can't do it. Yeah. Uh, and I also think if you're only doing it to make money, you really lack some very, very special uh, power and energy that is required to get you through those early difficult times. And so, you know, we, what we did in our research, we said, well, if only half of 1% of people follow that venture back model, what I call the Silicon Valley model in, in the U.S., then what is everybody else doing? And so our focus has been on, you know, what does the common everyday man or woman do to create a, a great company? Maybe they'll only do four, five million, 10 million, and hire 15 or 20 people. And so we call it the Main Street model, but, but our focus has been on what everybody else does. What, is, what does the common person do to build a great little company where they don't get funding, they don't want to go public, they don't even have an exit strategy, they're doing something they've always wanted to do in the arts or in music or you know, in some passion, and they've figured out how to do it, and they're doing it really well. And so those are the people that we've kind of been focusing on in our research and in our training programs the last few years. And it's funny, I remember when, when I worked in Silicon Valley, um, the, the idea of a lifestyle business um, or something that didn't scale in that type of way, we were talking about the Silicon Valley model, it was, it was really, it is still today, it's very, very much looked down upon. Yeah, yeah. one of my uh, members of my team actually did some research and he found that if, if you're in the United States and you play football in high school, you have a better chance of playing in the NFL at the highest level than you do creating a venture-backed company if you're an entrepreneur. You, you probably have a better chance of becoming the president of the United States and doing a venture-backed company. It just happens so infrequently 
And I mean, it's great. We love venture backed companies. We have no problems with them because they create great technology. They create a lot of jobs, but you know, most people just don't do that. They're not able to do it. They don't want to do it and they don't have access to the resources and then maybe not building the kind of company that's conducive to, to venture funding. And also, I mean, you see those kind of companies, the ones that, you know, in TechCrunch and those types of magazines that get, and websites that get talked about. And if all, it seems to be all the founders, they kind of look the same. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not yeah. a very, um, you know, you don't see a lot of women. You don't see people, you know, from minorities in those groups. Um, it's, it's quite a bland looking kind of um, group. And the thing I always really found fascinating about that is, the founder is lionized in 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 those types of uh, places where in gen- my experience of working in businesses big and small is it's been so much more about the the team than necessarily about the the founder themselves right yeah we uh you know in our research we really wanted our sample to look like the world so we got old entrepreneurs we got young entrepreneurs we got males we got females we've got you know, black and white and Asian and Hispanic, and we've got uh, every kind of venture from manufacturing to sales companies to service companies. And we've just, you know, collected this big, big data set. We've interviewed probably five or 600 of these people that have created these marvelous companies, and they they never get any press whatsoever. You know, all the articles are written about Facebook, Google, and eBay, mm. and no one's writing about the guy that's creating this phenomenal line of jewelry and shipping it around the world or this company that's making cushions for ski lifts you know and uh so those are the kinds of companies we focused on and we we've analyzed all of these interviews uh we've done them on film and we've looked at hundreds of hours of footage and we've said what are they doing in common and we've kind of come up with this model called the main street model which we think is is going to be growing significantly and more and more people will have to do it due to technology and um it's really quite simple. At the end of this bicycle tour, we had a number of number of journalists interview us, and um, which is a whole other story. We got tons of press because they were so fascinated. With this this professor was riding his bicycle across the country, that it ended up kind of being a little hook for the media. And but they all said, "What did you learn?" And and our answer was, "We learned that just about anybody can do this." And we feel strongly about that. And so on on that point, on the bicycle uh, tour going around, you know, you could have easily have just stayed in a nice warm study, an office, and <laughs> picked up the phone and, and, and done those <laughs> interviews. So what what made you kind of get on your bike and, uh, and, and go out there in that way? Well, I'll have to admit, uh, the first first reason was that I love cycling. I, I was a runner by early years and uh, just as I got older my knees couldn't handle it so my wife bought me a bicycle and I've been doing long distance endurance riding for about 10 years so I love the long challenging ride up and down through the mountains and and we and so that was one thing but the main thing was that um, you know we wanted to match the research method to the subject of study and we wanted to study people in smaller towns that were building these really exciting lifestyle businesses uh, in the U.S., a lot of people are moving out of the big cities. They're getting away from the smog and the pollution and the crime and the traffic. And some cities are growing uh, significantly. They're growing much faster than the U.S. population, and they're kind of becoming little hubs for creative people. And we thought, let's go visit those towns, but they're all off the main freeways. They're on little county roads, and they're you know up in the mountains, and they're in fun places by lakes and rivers. And we thought let's just let's do it slowly let's see it let's experience it let's go to their communities let's visit their post offices and maybe meet the mayor and and see their facilities and so we thought uh, doing it by bicycle would be a a perfect tr- a mode of travel for what we were trying to learn on this project and it was really really fun to be honest with you it was one of the one of the greatest career experiences i've ever had just the the challenge of going about 100 miles every day on a bike and then interviewing people all afternoon and then getting up and doing it again the next day. It was, uh, it was a fun challenge, and we saw the country uh, firsthand. And then when you were kind of going around there, I, I know a lot of our listeners who are really fascinated about creativity and the creative process and it, how innovation happens. When you were speaking to these entrepreneurs, for them, where were a lot of the ideas being generated? Where did the ideas for either the business or the products or services come, come from initially? Well, the book uh, uh, 
like you said, is a roadmap for how to build your own business. It's very practical. It's hands-on. It's here's a concept that makes a difference. And there's nine of those in the book that we discovered. But one of them had to do with where the ideas came from. And this is what we found. About a third of these people had actually worked in the industry in which they started their business. So they had worked in it for 10 or 15 years. They knew the customers. They knew the competitors. They knew the suppliers. They knew the problems with products. They saw the missing pieces. Some of them even had taken the idea to their employer and said, hey, customers are asking for this. Let's do that. And the employer usually said, oh, we don't do that around here. So they would leave and go do it on their own. So about a third of them worked right in that industry. Another third worked in a very closely related industry. For example, one guy was a pilot for 30 years, and then he started an aerial sightseeing company in a plane. He he bought a 1944 World War II biplane, a two-seater, and he now has a touring company where he flies people up and down the West Coast. So that's a related industry. He knew it. He knew aviation very well. But here's the interesting thing. About a third of these people were user entrepreneurs, I call them. They're experienced through uh, being customers. So they used the products over and over and over again, and they were buying them from multiple suppliers, and they knew which ones they liked and which ones they didn't like. And they found out that there was something missing, and many of them went out shopping trying to find the missing piece and couldn't find it. So as serious users, they launched the company. So they had no experience whatsoever in the industry, but they had tremendous experience as as a customer. For example, one of the women, uh, Nicole de Boom, is a professional triathlete, um, world class at the top of the game. Uh, she's won some major triathlons, and she was really tired of the clothing that was made. A lot of it was being designed by men for women athletes. And she was running by a building one day and saw her reflection in the glass, and she just said, this this, clo- this clothing looks terrible. I look like a boy. And so she went home and created a uh, a skirt, a running skirt for triathletes. And uh, she had hundreds of women that wanted it, and she actually run, won a major event wearing her first product and uh, has built a very, very successful company. She sold $25 million worth of women's running apparel. And uh, so she was a you what we call a user entrepreneur, and about a third of the people we interviewed were serious users. And there's it's kind of fascinating. There's a study here done by the Kauffman Foundation. They show that uh, 50% of the businesses that survive five years or more are created by user entrepreneurs, those that really know the product from the customer's perspective. So that's kind of where the ideas come from, either being in the industry or frequently using the products and. Uh, taking them apart, putting them back together, knowing that they're not quite what you want. And what role, you mentioned going around all these maybe smaller towns, what role does place have in entrepreneurship? Um, I remember when I did my MBA many years ago, they talked about creative clusters, how that's why cities are so such strong engines for, for innovation. But what you were talking about there is a lot of this, these new things, new businesses are being generated not necessarily in those big cities where you think traditionally those classes are happening, but they're happening in other places now. Yeah. Um, you know, these were small towns. Some of them were two and 3,000 people. Uh, the biggest ones were maybe 100,000 people, but they were not, you know, Chicago or New York or L.A. They were smaller towns. And these people, uh, a lot of them had moved there for lifestyle. They uh, said, I, I want a different way to live. I want to raise my children somewhere else. And they would move there, and then once they'd get there, they'd go, okay, now what do I do here? <laughs> they even showed up in these cities with no jobs. And that's why we thought they were good role models for this new economy where we're going to have to create our own jobs is because they had they'd gone to places where there were no jobs, and they've actually created jobs for themselves and others. And the beauty of this uh, new age we live in is the same technology that is eliminating jobs allows us to work from just about anywhere. And so in these smaller towns, because they had had experience in bigger cities and with, you know, industries, they were able to create products. Some of them created geographic businesses for the people in that town, but many of them created uh, niche businesses uh, where their customers now uh, can be reached worldwide. So, you know, the same powerful technology that was once only available to large corporations is now available to pretty much everybody. We all have cell phones. We all have computers. We can all access de- desktop publishing. 
And so they can do it from just about anywhere. And uh, it didn't seem to make any difference that they were in small towns or big towns. Uh, they were able to, to, to build a community of raving fans that loved them. And uh, those people are buying products from them. Some of them are doing national and even international business. In fact, one, this is really a fun story. This couple, they were driving through northern Idaho and fell in love with the, the beautiful, beautiful scenery in the small towns. And so they moved their family there. And the woman, Gail Williams, had been uh, sewing seat covers for big trucks. And she thought, you know, I could probably do uh, seats for uh, ski lifts. So she went to the Sun Valley Ski Resort, and she said, hey, let me recover your padding. And they said, great. So that was her first contract. And she has now serviced 600 ski resorts worldwide. She's a, a padding expert creating wow. seats for ski lifts out of this little teeny town in Idaho. That's amazing. I mean, what you were just talking about there, about many of these people kind of going to these places initially just because they wanted a, a better quality of life. Um, I, I guess, you know, that, that that's in kind of in, in management speak, that's kind of what they sometimes kind of talk about hygiene factors, um, about the, you know, the, 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 not just the type of work you do, but the, the, the place, the environment, um, the conditions of, of the place that you work. So it sounds like for these entrepreneurs, those conditions, the, not just the, exactly the, the technical type of work that they're doing, but also where they're doing it, the people that, they're, that they can build around them as well, the conditions of where they're working is very important to them. Yeah, and one, this is what was really fun uh, that we found is that in these smaller towns, these businesses get tremendous support from the city, from the mayor, from the citizens. People see them and go, wow, this person wants to be here, and they're building this exciting company, and they're creating jobs. Let's really support this business. And some of them even have told us, uh, a guy had a, a chain of pizza stores, he does far better in small towns because the fans love him, and uh, they want him to stay there, and they want him to be successful. And he actually built one in a larger city, and it didn't, it didn't work. He ended up shutting it down. And we found another woman... Um, in the Midwest, in Kansas, that, you know, she realized that women really still want to come into clothing stores and they want to touch the clothes and the fabric and try them on and try on the shoes. And, you know, you can buy anything you want online, but you're missing that tactical experience. And then and they wanted a human interaction. So she's built a whole chain of accessory stores in small towns all across Kansas. She has seven of them. And uh, it, they become gathering points in these smaller communities. It's it's kind of a high touch backlash to this high tech world that we've created. People still want human interaction. They want to be part of the community. They want to be able to talk to the owners. They want to be able to touch the merchandise. And so I think that's creating a lot of opportunity actually in this new world we live in. I guess it's like a you know the, the kind of backlash where so many of, of main streets were taken over by the same stores you know you, you could go into any town if you were going to, into um sonoma or if you went not maybe not sonoma is a good example but you go to pretty much any any town and they had these same stores and then obviously when online really came in you think, well why, what's the point of me going to those stores they're all the same you know, i can just get it from amazon so it's certainly a lot i know for me personally a lot of the stores i want to go into i want to have that more personalized touch because i can get anything i really want online i'm kind of going right. for the experience of, of the shopping experience yeah, and that's what we found. We've even found some independent bookstores. Uh, for example, in San Francisco, there are no big chain books. The Barnes & Noble stores don't exist. They all left. Yeah. And some of the smaller independent bookstores, they have author readings, and they have competitions, and they have classes. And people like to come and gather and be part of a community. And you don't get that when you you know buy everything that you buy through e-commerce. So there's the opportunity to balance that technology. If I want something fast and quick, I just order it online. But if I want to go have an experience, it's kind of like when, uh, you know, video and uh, DVDs came out, uh, people thought that theaters were going to go away with. No one was ever going to go to a theater again to watch a movie. But the fact is people love to go to an event together. Yeah. So a lot of this, uh, you know, this new high-tech world, is giving us opportunities. It's first, giving us opportunities to work from anywhere, and second, it's giving us opportunities to create more of a, a human inter interaction, a human experience, and create communities of people that like to congregate and get together. Yeah, it was it was funny just seeing even within the music industry as an example where while the record industry was really being was suffering from piracy and and uh, streaming and different things like that, the live industry was 
was booming because people still wanted that that experience of coming together being that 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 way and i've just noticed i was recently involved in some stuff around virtual reality and they're talk, t- talking about kind of like almost like arcade style gaming sent places coming back um now because everyone's been used to kind of gaming at home where now they want to kind of go into these places which were, are all set up perfectly for virtual reality where people can kind of be together and, and live in those and, and have that kind of virtual reality experience but in the same physical space yeah and i think this is a, a great one of the reasons i think it's easier than ever to start a business is we all have the same technology and we can reach markets far beyond our geography but also we're seeing this really uh you know this uh, love for smaller businesses, love for local businesses, buying local, supporting the local community entrepreneur, bringing people together into groups, letting people interact with each other. And so the jobs are going to be different. Uh, more of us will have to create our own jobs and have our own companies, our own smaller companies, but the opportunities are still going to be there. Work's just going to be different than it was, but it has been. And now you obviously help train and teach uh, the next generation of, of entrepreneurs. But going back to you know to your own career that you've had over, over these years, can you tell us about a time where you worked on a project, maybe you worked in a business, and you gave it your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason it just didn't work out like you'd hoped? And more importantly, what were the lessons that you took away from that experience? Well, you know, I, I taught at the university and uh, realized I wanted to be a real business leader and a real entrepreneur, and I left the university and one of the first companies I started was a, a uh, health food business. My wife has a degree in nutrition and uh, fitness, and I had you know my degree in, in business and, and strategy. And so we created the first line of uh, frozen dessert products that had no fat and limited calories. And it was a product line called Northern Lights. And, uh, you know, again, I wanted to create the envy of an industry. I wanted, as a professor, I wanted to show people that I could actually build a company and then I thought I'd go back to the university someday later on. And so that's what we did. We built, um, it was a vertically integrated business. So we produced our own, we created our own products. We produced our own products. We distributed our own products. We sold them through wholesale channels. And then we sold them through retail channels. And so it was a kind of a large experiment. And um, it actually worked really well. We ended up selling that company to a publicly traded company in Toronto. And then I felt, you know, I was finally credible to be able to not only teach what I had been reading in books, but to teach what I'd done in the real business world. So it was, it ended up being successful. And, um, you know, the failure rate is, is 50%. As you know, if you start a new business, you have a 50-50 chance of making it. But I think if you if you implement correct practices, if you understand the, the key differences that make the difference between success and failure, and you wait till those factors are in place before you launch, you know, I don't think... I don't think we have to see such a high failure rate. In fact, we feel that people that go through our programs and learn these key practices increase their odds of success up to maybe 80 or even 90%. So I I certainly learned a lot of things from making mistakes along the way, but the business success, the business itself was actually a success, the first one that I created. And on this creative journey um, that you've had as building these businesses and also lecturing and speaking on, on, on these areas as well, can you tell us about an insight or, or a light bulb moment, a, a point in your life where you either a new distinction came to you or you went, oh, okay, this is the direction I need to be going with my career and my work? Well, several of those were, have been really important to me. Uh, I guess the first one is that I realized is that uh, you got to do this with teams. you got to build an entrepreneurial team. One person working alone solo isn't going to be as successful as a team of motivated people working together. And so if you want to be an entrepreneur but you don't have an idea, you can join a team early on. And I took a good assessment of you know what I was good at and what I wasn't good at, and I realized what people I needed to fill in the gaps. And so I went out and found people that knew construction and that knew leasing and that knew you know, manufacturing, and uh, I couldn't have done it without that team. And so, you know, all the successful companies pretty much build teams of people, and you allow that team to have that same entrepreneurial experience that you have maybe as the as the founder. And that's where the real power and the motivation and the engagement comes from is letting people share in the project. Uh, probably another really big insight, you know, I'd taught about capital-intensive businesses before, but I didn't really realize what that meant until I started building retail stores and 
you know, it cost two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars per store, and the only way I could grow and make money was I had to keep building more stores. And so, if you look at you know discounted cash flow, you have to discount the future based on the cost of capital. And so I thought there's got to be a way to sell these products without having to build big units. And so we started uh, building smaller kiosks in malls and stadiums and arenas and grocery stores. And then we actually started wholesaling the product. So the wholesale business came second after we'd already built a retail business. But we were able to grow significantly more once we started uh, finding ways to get the product into the market without having to spend a lot of capital to do that. And as you've traveled around meeting all these different entrepreneurs and you'll have met a lot of, a lot of them that are you know really happy and they're loving what they're doing and feeling, living a really kind of creative life and building products and building, adding value for their, their employees and for, the, for their customers as well. Is, is there one piece of advice that you heard from any of these entrepreneurs that really you know, sticks with you and you, you often uh, look to share with your students and other people you're speaking with? Well, one of the first things we noticed about these uh, the 100 people we interviewed on this bicycle ride is they were all very purpose-driven. They had a clear purpose for doing what they were doing, and it didn't have to do with making a lot of money. In fact, not one of them mentioned making money as a primary driver. And so they were you know, creating jobs for themselves or their family members. They were creating jobs for their communities. They were uh, giving phenomenal service, better than they had received in the industry. They were working on a problem that they uh, really were intrigued with and wanted to solve, or they were doing something they were passionate about. And that's what drove them. That's what got them up in the morning, and that's what got them through those difficult times. And, you know, having that engaging purpose um, is so much more powerful than just saying, I just want to make a lot of money. If, you, if all you want to do is make money, there are other ways to do it faster. And uh, it's probably not enough of a motivation to get through that first three to five years of, you know, hard times and hurdles you have to get over. And so, you know, building a purpose-driven business uh, that is contributing more to the world than just you making money, we thought, you know, is very critical. It attracts team members that have that same value set and have that same purpose. And probably more important, it attracts customers to, to the business. You know, the great book by Simon Sinek, you know, Start With Why, he argues yeah. convincingly that people buy, they don't buy what we do, they buy why we do it. And so these people had, had a clear, engaging, driving, motivating purpose, and they were able to articulate that purpose, and people knew about it. For example, one gentleman we met in a small town, he, he was in the small town that he was raised in, that his you know, grandfather moved two years before, and his goal is to create 100 jobs in that city. And when we last talked to him, uh, he was up to 70. He'd created 70 jobs in his small town. So uh, the woman I met, Nicole the Boom, that I told you about, creating these women's skirt sports, her passion was just to make women look pretty and feel good about themselves while they were exercising. And so I could go on and on. That was you know, one of the, one of the first things that we noticed. And uh, another kind of interesting thing was, you know, they all work very, very hard. If you don't have a work ethic, you can't do this. And that doesn't mean it's drudgery because they were doing something they loved. They were they were happy to put in the time, but they worked very, very hard um, uh, for for quite a few years to get the business to, to where it was when we, we found them. So a strong work ethic, a real purpose and passion, you know, building teams, and probably one new concept that I uh, hadn't seen much before is they were they were building multiple streams of revenue. Mm-hmm. So they weren't just, just doing one thing. They had their main venture. Maybe they were even consulting part-time. Some of them were investing in real estate and buying their buildings. And uh, then they were spinning off related products. So they, they had a handful of things they were doing that were related, kind of like a portfolio of products uh, and this these multiple sources of revenue made them less vulnerable to failure in the long run. So those were some of the main things we saw. Yeah. I mean, we obviously in, in business, we talk about like kind of having a portfolio career and having these different, I know you've written extensively on things like me, uh, LLC, having a a kind of career strategy with these multiple income streams. And I was talking to someone just the other day um, and uh, I was in uh, Scotland and I was talking to this um, person and it reminded me actually that, that, that mindset of having these different, different income streams, uh, we have a thing in Scotland that's called uh, they're called crofters. They're like um, small ho- small holders of of land um, in very rural um, uh, locations. 
And often that person will be, there will be a, a sheep, they'll maybe have some sheep doing some sheep farming maybe the um they're also the postman the local <laughs> the local postman maybe they'll also be making another thing which they they um they sell online a product that they they make and they sell online as well so they have these little these multiple income streams but what it does make them is extremely resilient to the economy going up and down yeah absolutely you know if you have uh, peter drucker used to talk about this uh, at the end of his life he talked about portfolios of products that you manage a group of products like you do a stock portfolio and you got three or four at the very top that are making most of your income and then you got some in the middle that are pretty steady and then you got some at the bottom you just have to let go you can't hang on to things that no longer work and you constantly have to be adding new products to that portfolio and so the 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 thing that we tended to see is that, that when they added new products they were adding products that solved customers problems so, for example, if a customer has to go three or four places to get a problem solved and you're one of the stops, well, you might as well provide the other things they need so you become a one-stop shop for that particular problem. For example, one of the uh, families that we met, uh, they're engineers, and they moved to a small town in Oregon because they were tired of Los Angeles, and they started designing uh, biogas power plants. They were you know, drawing those plans for people that were building the plants, and then they realized that uh, their customers were having a hard time getting them built because people weren't real familiar with biogas plants. So they launched a construction division to build the plants they were designing. And then they realized their customers were having a hard time monitoring the output of those plants. So they built a suite of software to uh, manage the plants remotely. And so they, they're now designing plants, building plants, and managing plants um, and then they were flying in and out of the airport so much they ended up buying the airport in that city. <laughs> and then they put up some retail, some space, some office space, so they house other entrepreneurs they lease space to. And so they got five things they're doing in this town, but they're they're kind of all related to the customer's overall problem. So they're, they're always kind of so thinking, they're not, they're thinking customer first. They're, they're thinking what they're, they're they're stepping in the shoes of that customer, and they're really getting very very familiar with with the problems of that customer and, and trying to create solutions for them. Yeah, and the, cu- the question is, what else does this customer need that's yeah. related to what I'm already doing? So you maximize the channel. You've spent time developing this channel of distribution. Now you're saying, what else can we push through it that people want that they're buying anywhere, anyway, somewhere else, perhaps? And this is obviously what Amazon so logical, Amazon Amazon does really well. And you know, even the, there's a lot of these massive companies, they they think about the lifetime value of that that total customer, not just I'm in the book business, so I'm just going to sell them books. Right. Yeah, great example. And, and do you have a, an online resource or a tool or an app like Evernote or Gmail that you, that you love and you don't think you could live without now? Well, I use, you know, I use, uh, of course, a lot of things like that in business. Yes, I can't think of anything in particular, but uh, I use a lot of, you know, apps and uh, email and websites and so on. And when when you were traveling, you were going from uh, you know town to town on 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 the bike. Were there were there any apps that you found really useful for um, either on the cycling? I'm a cyclist myself as well, or or uh, um, or just kind of keeping up and and being able to um, write down your thoughts and things as as you were as you were coming up with them. Well, you know, we used of course uh, GPS. We were in a large, we had a large support uh, motorhome that followed us, and uh, so we were booking appointments and looking for companies, so we were obviously searching websites and looking at you know, sites from the Chamber of Commerce, and we were using our GPS apps to get to where we were going, and I was using my notes to take notes, uh, audio notes along the way of things that I later wrote about. So, yeah, we used technology along the way. And finally, if you could only recommend one book to our listeners, and actually one record, one album as well, what would they be? Well, um of course, I'm I'm really biased about this book because <laughs> I wrote it. But the purpose in writing Main Street Entrepreneur was to create a roadmap of exactly what common people do to build successful companies from A to Z, and outline those in a very logical, systematic order. And then another goal I had was to write a business book that was not that was not boring. I wanted it to read like a novel and be quite engaging. And so we put the bicycle ride as a backdrop to the story, so you get to see this you know, epic sweeping adventure across America. And then the entrepreneurs tell the story 
And uh, so I, I'm quite pleased with how the book turned out. It's getting great editorial reviews. And uh, so I'm right now recommending my own book to people. And it's funny that, that using that, um, that, the, that type of narrative is, is not that usual in business books for some reason. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the ones that spring to mind, people like e, um, the E-Myth Revisited, um, my, Michael uh, E. Gerber's book. Um, and there's a few other ones in the back here, but they don't often lead from a narrative standpoint. Yeah, I think, you know, The E-Myth is a great book. I think The $100 Startup is great. I think The Lean Startup is good, although it really focuses more on tech and venture-backed companies. But I, um, you know, I thought if people could read, a lot of people think they would like to start a business, but they just don't know how. And I thought if I could attract them to a fun book they could read, they would go, you know what, maybe I could do that. And so that was the purpose. And writing the book. It was for all the people that would like to start a company but aren't sure what steps to take. So it's quite a very basic, fun, simple book. And what would the album be that you would recommend? Was there an album that you, uh, that you listened to on the road or a song you listened to on the road uh, as you were traveling from town to town? Well, I uh, you know, love classic rock and roll, so I have playlists with all the old uh, songs uh, from the even the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and I have a number of playlists, and that's what I listen to when I'm out riding around, is music as opposed to you know educational uh, audios. So final question, let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start yeah. from scratch. So all you have are the tools of your trade and the knowledge and skills that you've acquired over the years, but you no, no one, no one knows who you are, and you're looking to start a new business. What would you do? How would you, get, how would you restart? You know, I'd probably follow the exact steps that we've outlined in this book is I'd look at my, um, all of my work experience. I'd say, where have I worked? What problems have I seen? What products do I use? Uh, what am I frustrated with? And what is a good match between my skill set and the needs that I'm seeing in my own communities right now? And then I would build a team of people, and uh, I would create my first product. I, I say build a few, sell a few, learn a lot. I'd get something in the market quickly, a prototype, without spending tons of money. And I would just build from there, build from cash flow with a great, exciting team doing something we were familiar with well, that we Mike, perceived as a real need in the marketplace. Well, Mike, it's been fascinating kind of learning about the book and learning about your, your journey. And it really was a journey on a bike as well. So um, I wish you all, all, all the best with, with going around America and interviewing all these, uh, these great uh, companies and entrepreneurs. What's the best way for people to connect with you and learn more about um, what you're, you're working on? Yeah, the best website is themainstreetentrepreneur.com. And it talks about the book. It talks about the documentary movie that we're doing. Uh, it's got all of our resources. We're actually funding the last part of this movie with a Kickstarter campaign. And uh, so you can read all about that and what we're doing and see some videos there. But uh, the MainStreetEntrepreneur.com is the best resource for what we're doing. Well, Mike, thanks for so much coming on the, sh on the show today. And I wish you be all the best with, the with your journey. Thanks so much, James. It was a pleasure talking with you. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.